Então, uh, para essa segunda sessão, vai ser inteiramente em inglês. Então, eu vou moderar a segunda sessão em inglês e vou chamar os uh, panelistas uh, que vão compor a mesa em inglês. So, as I was mentioning, the second session will be entirely in English. So, I would like to call uh, the Cyberbricks fellow researcher uh, here at FGB. So, starting in, in, in BRICS order would be of uh, Brazil, Daniel Oppelman, who is a researcher at the University of Sao Paulo, and of course, our Cyberbricks research fellow. <laughs> Min Zhang, who is professor uh, at, uh, sorry, in, in Brick's order again, <laughs> R before C, <laughs> just to check if you were still alive and following. So, in, in Brick's order, R, we have uh, Professor Andrei Shishabovic from the Moscow School of Economics, the Higher School of Economics of Moscow. Following in BRICS order, with I of India, uh, Anya Kovac, who is uh, the director of the Internet Democracy Project India and our research fellow here. <laughs> then China, we have uh, uh, Min Zhang, who is uh, associate professor at the uh, University of uh, North Carolina, Charlotte, uh, and also, of course, our research fellow here. Last but of course not least, Sagwa Dimabunde, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Cape Town and of course, oh sorry, at the University of Western Cape and of course our research fellow here at Tech. So, what a better uh, segue from the, between the first uh, panel and the second one than a couple of spoilers from <laughs> the uh, panelists about uh, uh, the uh, recent creation of a data protection regulation here in Brazil. Uh, the, the panelists will discuss different uh, teams. We are, just to provide you a couple of extra information on the project, we are not only mapping several legislations that we are, we are analyzing in the various BRICS country, but also then uh, each of the Cyber BRICS fellow is discussing and working and producing uh, academic literature on the specific topic uh, of interest. So uh, each of them will discuss their specific topic of interest, uh, and uh, without further, further ado, I would like to uh, give the floor to Daniel Opperman to start with uh, his uh, presentation on uh, the recent evolutions of data protection in Brazil. Thank you very much, Luca. Um, do we have... yes, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, very happy to see so many people here interested in this session, in this topic. Um, and I'm also very grateful that Luca mentioned in his first uh, presentation that he's not giving too much spoilers. Because when he started, I was like, no, I, I also wanted to say that. But then he said, no, I'm not going to give you spoilers. Okay, thank you very much for that. <laughs> so, um, um, actually what I will do today is uh, give you a short presentation about uh, the, the Brazilian context of this project. I'm the B in the BRICS project and uh, my presentation will be on the cyber security, data protection and cyber defense in Brazil. So, um, as a start, I think, yes. So, as a first slide, I, I give you here the an overview of the, the project structure, actually, when we started uh, discussing the, the project and how we, how we could, like, organize it. We, um, we first thought about, okay, we work on data protection and cyber security, but as Luca has mentioned before, then we found out that actually we have to split it up, restructure it a little bit more. And uh, so in the end it became cybersecurity as a main topic, and then we created a number of subcategories, which you can see here on the slides. Um, data protection, cybercrime, cyber defense, consumer protection, and public order. And what we're doing in the project is we're analyzing all these categories in the different countries. 
and um, everyone has also chosen one topic to work on for a, a final publication that we're developing. So um, my plan is to to talk a little bit about data protection and a little bit on the cyber defense topic. To start with, I give you a, a short number to know what we're talking about. We have seen in the, in the before slides also numbers about the uh, the quantity of users of internet users that we have in the individual countries. I brought you here a number of the uh, CITIC uh, research, which showed the which shows the the current number of of internet users in Brazil, uh, which is actually from 2017. So, 67% uh, of the Brazilian uh, population were considered to be internet users, and in a population of 209 million people, these are about 140 million. So, that is of course quite a, a substantial number, the, the numbers have been growing over the past 10 years. And now we have reached this uh, 140, maybe we are now already at 150 million. So one of the important topics that came up over the last years was the question of data protection. And um, as we have talked about uh, before in a number of sessions also with our students, that uh, we're actually, people are actually enjoy giving away their data. So um, here I list a few a few places where people actually give out their data without thinking too much about it. Uh, we have social media that everyone is using mostly on a, a lot of people on, the, on a daily basis. Uh, payments on credit cards, uh, debit cards is also a big uh, data creation machine, let's say. Uh, customer registration in any kind, we know this when we have uh, anywhere when we go to a store or anyone, any uh, online store or, or so like offline store, uh, people like to register us as customers. We like to give our data sometimes if we do not think about it. Uh, the same goes out to, to promotions. You give me your CPF number, I give you a little discount. And search engines and apps are other places where we share our data, uh, mostly without reflecting too much about where the data goes, what the companies are doing with the data. And uh, in the end, we're, we're handing them out maybe in exchange of a little advantage, but in the end we don't know or we don't think about that these organizations that are taking their data, that are receiving the data, they can make a lot with this data. And we have no possibility to, to access the data in the end, to maybe change it, to delete it, uh, as, soon, uh, as long as we don't have uh, proper regulation about this. So these are a couple of quotes that I've heard over the the past few years or that I saw somewhere. The first one, I want to buy email addresses is uh, it's a very common thing on, on the internet that people actually, a few years ago, still like to sell email addresses on the internet. It still, it still is, a, of course, going, but uh, the difference is that nowadays these types of markets are not that public anymore. But I remember that a few years ago I just found websites that actually had the URL um, Eu quero comprar endereços de email.com.br or something like this. And you went there and you just paid with some common payment uh, gateway and you could get like a million email addresses or a million user data. So this is, it's not that easy anymore, but nevertheless, uh, data is of course still sold on the internet. Please enter your CPF number. Now everybody knows that's wherever you go. People ask you to give them your CPF number so they can store it and use it for whatever business reason they have. Uh, we have the name of your phone. Oh, why we have the name of your no? Why we have the name of your phone in our system? You must have given it to us. So sometimes we don't even know where our data is going, how they got it, how we can access it. So our data is everywhere. Your fingerprints are safe with us. Nobody can access uh, any of our data. This is, of course, also very common that uh, people who attend you somewhere, they don't actually know uh, if the data is really safe. But they tell you, of course, no, it's no problem, the data is always safe. We know the data is not always safe. It's not possible to delete customer data. This is one of my favorites. Um, sometimes when you call a company and uh, you want to delete an account and you ask them, please, could you delete my data? Then sometimes people tell you, well, it's technically not possible to delete data, which is, of course, not the case. But uh, since we don't have, or unless we don't have 
uh, proper regulation about this. We also cannot change the situation. So over the past years, there was growing awareness uh, happening in regard of data protection. It's a few very important events were the NSA scandals in 2013, the Cambridge Analytica scandal in 2018. I'm not going to go too much into detail, I think everybody knows them. Uh, then we have lots of data breaches in all major online providers and also, of course, in the smaller ones that do not appear in the media. Uh, today we have more data protection awareness than 10 years ago, but we also have much more users, so the risk of losing data is still there. Uh, legal protection mechanisms are increasing, and this is one of the uh, subjects or one of the topics that we're analyzing in this project. And as uh, Luca also mentioned before, the new uh, data protection law in Brazil was passed in 2018. So the last, uh, the law is the result of an ongoing debate over the past years, and uh, it was signed in 2018. Uh, by, by then President Temer, and uh, it's supposed to become into to go into force in 2020, in August 2020. One of the things that still had to be tackled was the uh, establishment of the National uh, Data Protection Authority, and uh, this, as we have learned now, is also has recently happened, just a few days ago actually. Oh, this is, uh, before that I brought a few details about the law. So 60, 65 articles, if we compare this uh, to the cybercrime law, the Brazilian cybercrime law for example, this is quite extensive, the, the cybercrime law is very short, the data protection law is very much elaborated. So there's a big difference. Um, the law mentions a few of the leading principles being uh, privacy protection, freedom of expression information, economic and technological development, human rights, citizenship, consumer protection, and more, of course. And um, over here we have a few categories uh, where the, the law does not apply for journalistic, uh, journalistic situations, in, in, for academia, for non-commercial data, for public and national security, there are exceptions written in the law. The law has a number of, deficients, uh, of uh, definitions I brought uh, a few here. It's defining personal data, databases, operators, controllers, international data transfers, and more. Also, the, the national authorities, of course, defined. And um, so, just to go over to the next. So, the, this uh, national data authority was established just a few days ago, and um, it will be uh, related to the presidency of the republic and it is foreseen that uh, in the next two years it might become uh, an agency, maybe something like an Anateo, uh, but this is just, uh, it's too early to say now what's, how it is going to be, it still has to be established. It was just written into the law, it was agreed upon, but it's not set up so far, so this is uh, where we are now with the law. Okay, uh, actually I have, um, I have one minute left, do I? So I can uh, give a few details about cyber defense, which is another uh, interesting topic. We often put cyber security and cyber defense in, in one box, but actually for this project we separated them uh, and we looked at cyber defense as a topic that is mostly related to uh, national defense. And uh, so I listed here uh, a couple of uh, crucial moments uh, in Brazil, documents and institutions that were uh, written and created over the past few years, and that is that are currently paving the way for the cyber defense scenario in Brazil. One is the 2008 National Defense Strategy, where for the first time uh, cyberspace was one of the strategic uh, was, was mentioned as uh, having a strategic importance for the country. The 2010 Green Book on Cyber Security, it was on cyber security, not on cyber defense, nevertheless it was a very important publication at that time. Two years later, the Centro de Defesa Cibernetica, CDC, was inaugurated in the Ministry of Defense. This happened in the context of major events like the, uh, the World Cup and the Olympics. So, um, two years later, we have 
the, we had the military doctrine on cyber defense. This is a, a crucial document that was published in 2014. It brings a number of definitions uh, that are important to, to work with cyber security, cyber defense, uh, the definitions about uh, what is a cyber attack, what is cyber war, what is uh, the servers, the DDoS attacks, etc., etc. Then um, what we have right now is uh, the 2018 the Prodefesa project on cyber defense. This is uh, another edition of the Prodefesa uh, research program uh, from the uh, financed by by Capis. And um, in the context of this program, there is a project on cyber defense that was launched in 2018, and it began working in 2019, coordinated by uh, Professor Marcos Guedes from the Federal University of Pernambuco and also here in Rio de Janeiro by Professor Luis uh, uh, Guidoi uh, the Escola de Comando de Estado Maior do Exército uh, This program or this project is going to take place over the next four years and it's going to bring new insights into the development of cyber defense strategies in Brazil. And finally, just uh, a few months ago, we had the inauguration of the National School on Cyber Defense in Brasilia that was already set up in 2015 uh, in cooperation with the University of Brasilia. Uh, it was created as a nucleo at that time and uh, now it was uh, started, re new started or established as a, as a national school on cyber defense. So this is also uh, an important step that was taken this year. And uh, yeah, this is um, so far uh, about the scenario in Brazil that I want to present now. Um, at the end I say obrigado, of course. And um, so I give back to Luca, thanks. Thank you very much, Daniel. And actually, something that I, I hope you will be, uh, as participants, able also to grasp during the, this uh, session and even more the next one, uh, how all these topics are all intertwined and it is not possible to discuss them into silos. And actually, if uh, one wants to have a complete strategy, a strategic vision, uh, one has to adopt a systemic approach. So. Uh, what we are trying to do in this session is start for those who are not already uh, practitioners or studying these uh, topics, start to give you an idea of how these topics are developing and what are the links between them. And the fact that also Daniel mentioned uh, cyber defense right after uh, data protection should also let you think about the national defense, the cyber security dimensions of data protection. This is not only something the user must be, um, uh, must be preoccupied about, but it also it may become even a uh, national defense uh, concern. Now, speaking about national defense... Uh, okay, can, I, can I just uh, answer quickly on that? Because this is actually something very interesting that I was uh, thinking about yesterday. Sorry, like, just, uh, just to pick this up. Um, since we have like a multidisciplinary team, we're also working with different approaches, of course. And uh, and so, I was just yesterday having like communicating with a colleague from political science. I'm also a political scientist, and uh, and I was like thinking about okay, he he's, he's working on cyber defense. So how can I explain to him actually that data protection and the data protection law is interesting for him? Uh, when you work on cyber defense. So this is uh, really the, the connection that we're making in this project, bringing these uh, different levels together. Excellent. Uh, yeah, and actually something that in a law school must also be highlighted is that not all uh, members of the uh, team are lawyers. Actually, lawyers are uh, well, not a minority, but uh, uh, let's say half of the team so far. So a good representation, but not too much. <laughs> So, uh, speaking of lawyers, uh, I, will, I would like to ask Andre to uh, provide us an overview of the most recent uh, evolutions in terms of internet regulation uh, in Russia. And uh, I was already mentioning before in my initial remarks that uh, over the past couple of months there have been a lot of uh, uh, news uh, in Russia with regard to internet regulation. So, Andre, please go ahead. 
Thank you very much, Professor Bellio. That would tell uh, something about the current trends in uh, the Internet governance legislation in Russia. First of all, that would talk about uh, a trend to, towards sovereignization of the Internet regulation in Russia. It was introduced uh, even several years ago. When, uh, but uh, I suppose that, and I would like to prove that with my presentation, that the very sovereignty over the Internet is quite impossible. Uh, because the Internet is the network which goal is the international cross-border transfer of information, cross-border access of information. And uh, this uh, trend towards uh, sovereignty of the internet is quite impossible to organize and uh, uh, that's why I'd like to discuss Russian uh, recent developments in this uh, manner. So, even 2014, uh, a Russian uh, member of uh, upper house of parliament introduced uh, so-called uh, uh, Chiburashka Net. Chiburashka is a cartoon character uh, which is uh, proposed the closure of the national segment of the internet from the outside, but just a, a proposal. After that, uh, he referred that it only relates to uh, so-called scientific information and so forth. But uh, now uh, these things can become a bit of reality because we introduced the Cyber Sovereignty Bill, which was uh, recently adopted and signed by the President of the Russian Federation. And since the 1st of November, we, ha we will have the Cyber Sovereignty Bill that makes technical, uh, technically possible to switch off from the global internet in case of some emergency. And there's a quotation of the President of Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, who said that there is a need to be ready if the country will be disconnected from the internet. Uh, this is uh, the position of the President, and now we have a law that make technically possible uh, that make it technically possible to switch off from the global internet. Now that to talk uh, uh, as far as I'm uh, as it was mentioned before, I'm a constitutional lawyer, and uh, I'd like to tell you that the sovereignty, of course, is a ba basic and a major feature of the state. But uh, the, the sovereignty has territorial borders and. Uh, State has sovereignty in the Russian Federation in the Constitution that the Russian uh, Federation extends its sovereignty throughout its territory, but not throughout the networks or other technological system. Uh, also, the uh, Supreme Court of Russian Federation uh, su supports this position that sovereignty uh, belongs to the uh, Russian Federation in the territory of its federal subjects as well as aerial space and the maritime space, but not, uh, but actually uh, sovereignty has nothing to do with the internet and the, the and, uh, networks. Uh, also, there was introduced the so-called fake news law, uh, which uh, make administrative punishment for distribution of Socially, uh, socially unreliable uh, information uh, on uh, uh, as far as in the internet, it, it makes it under administrative uh, administrative punishment. For example, the threat of harm of life and health and citizens, and uh, the threat of mass disturbance of public order, and threat of uh, interference and functioning of threat of termination of support or life support facilities. It's something like that goes to distribution of the fake news. It make it uh, punishment. Uh, when it will be distributed on mass media as well as on the internet. Uh, now, uh, the, the, this, this law is very famous. It is of the uh, Yerevan anti-terrorist methods, uh, which are required to store 
all the text messages of users, the conversation and uh, images, sounds and all the traces of the communication up to six months on the servers and uh, uh, that information could be rendered to the law enforcement authorities on their request. Um, some uh, internet uh, uh, internet freedom activists and, uh, and uh, internet freedom advocates believe that uh, this uh, Yerevaya anti-terrorist amendment is uh, introduction of the censorship over the internet. Also, there is a quotation from uh, the author of the lawyer in the Yerevaya, head of the State Duma, the Russian Parliament. Uh, anti-corruption committee that the internet is destroying the notion of boundaries and the concept of sovereignty. Uh, there is the case based on this Yerevaya law that when the uh, well messenger uh, telegram was banned, uh, is prohibited to use in Russia. Uh, according to the decision of the Takansk Court of Moscow, it uh, supports the request to block uh, this messenger on a non-compliance of this uh, of this uh, of this law, and the the uh, telegram was blocked in Russia due to this uh, uh, due to this law. Uh, uh, but. Uh, Practice shows that it is possible. It is still possible to use uh, Telegram in Russia, but with using VPN or even without using VPN in Russia. Also, uh, a, uh, now our new section of the personal data. Uh, Russian Federation is one of the states which introduced the data localization. So all the personal data of Russian citizens should be stored on the databases inside the territory of, uh, of the Russian Federation. Only inside the uh, on servers located only inside the territory of Russian Federation. There are uh, not, not, not so many states that are following this, but uh, this uh, data localization law could make a serious threat of business. For example, uh, some uh, uh, economic companies counted that uh, uh, this entry to, in, of the for, into the force of this law will decrease the counter TDP by uh, 0, 0.27%. Uh, for example, it is loss of 2,086 million rubles. It also, uh, some actual, when this law was discussed, it was uh, discussed that this law could make harm to the internet users for um, uh, damage to their own, uh, ability for online purchases, for booking flights, booking hotels, as well as obtaining foreign entry visas, for example, because uh, foreign entry visas require to store uh, uh, the personal data inside the servers uh, of these embassies. Uh, uh, for example, to, uh, to, to, uh, to get the entry visa to, for Brazil, is also need to make the online questionnaire. Uh, also, uh, and there's a big problem of jurisdiction and nationality. It's very difficult to establish uh, with accuracy the nationality of internet user. The nationality of internet user could not be established with the accuracy because uh, in some cases, you could uh, provide uh, your nationality by default. And also it's quite possible to avoid this blocking of websites uh, by using VPNs, anonymizers, and even this network like Tor, which, which was previously mentioned by my colleagues. Also there is the uh, possibility of straight of the governmental control of the internet activities. This is Alexander Jarov, head of the Roskomnadzor, Russian Telecommunication Regulator. Uh, they said that the LinkedIn case is quite possible because we will uh, carry out this law in any case. Uh, but some internet experts believe that this, uh, it could be an additional opportunity for, for Russian law enforcement, law enforcement agencies. Or to control over the internet activities of users. 
there's another uh, uh, case, the, the LinkedIn uh, social network was uh, blocked on, based on uh, failure to accommodate with the data localization law. Also, it is possible to use this network, but with using uh, Tor or VPN services. And there is the, 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 the last one, the last position, the anti-anonymizer legislation. It is not possible to use un anonymizer services in Russia while, uh, while they are gaining uh, access to the prohibited serv uh, uh, services. And so, there's my conclusion that uh, um, the uh, deal of uh, the national government, any single national government, is to implement international law in regard to the internet because there is this uh, parable about the flying pan and the elephant. So different people touching elephant and the nothing, uh, they have different understanding of what it is. So there is different approaches to regulate the internet because the internet is bigger than the, even the biggest country like Russia is, for example. So we need to uh, avoid fragmentation and we believe to, oh, for example, I believe that, uh, that uh, the multi-stakeholder approach is the best solution of the all possible cases without threatening the human rights of internet users. I think that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andre, for your uh, impressive capacity of co-stating all of the most recent evolution of internet news. Uh, excellent job and actually it was very interesting to speak about sovereignty now because it provides us a very good segue uh, for the next uh, presentation by Anya uh, that is going to uh, uh, analyze the recent, most recent evolutions in terms of data protection in India uh, but also trying to deconstruct the sovereignty argument that has been put forward to, to uh, uh, back the uh, data protection uh, bill and proposing a very interesting approach on individual sovereignty. So please, Anya, go ahead. Obrigada, Luca. Boa tarde. I wish I could do all of this in Portuguese, but unfortunately that's not going to happen yet. Um, I do think that there is a lot of overlap actually between the concerns of Russia and India, even though in many ways they are very different states. And as uh, Luca already pointed out earlier, we got uh, a new government elected on the 23rd of May, very recently, uh, which is a continuation of the previous government and one with an overwhelming majority. And within a week, the new minister of IT, who is also the old minister of IT, the fact that passing uh, the job data protection bill in Parliament is going to be one of the priorities for this government. In the previous government, uh, there were a whole range of uh, efforts to start developing a data protection framework within India. We don't have a horizontal data protection law yet, but at the moment there is that draft bill that's on the table. Uh, there is a draft e-commerce policy that also looks at a lot of data issues. There is a DNA bill on the table and this is just a few of the examples. So really a lot is happening in that field. By way of background, to first give you a bit of the flavor of the Indian situation and the challenges that we are up against, there are really two broad frameworks of thinking or broad concerns that are informing all of these efforts. For the Indian government, one big concern is always terrorism. And that does not only uh, shape its policy around cyber security, it also really shapes the policy around data protection. Terrorism is, of course, a real concern in India. Uh, we have uh, conflict in several parts of the country, and I think most well known is possibly the conflict in Kashmir. Um, and this is real, right? And it is an obligation of states to keep its uh, citizens secure. So taking these concerns into account is something that is obviously important for the Indian government. The other concern that is really influencing these policies, and I'll illustrate this a bit more later on, is um, broader concerns around data colonialism, and that language is used in India, and then the reassertion of sovereignty, and I guess that's where the link with Russia comes in, um, as an effort to take back control 
over what is perceived to be lost. This also means that questions around data in India are becoming a question of nationalism. It is about national pride. And that makes the debate much more complex to intervene in, 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 many, uh, in many ways. Um, to give you a little bit of a sense of the direction in which legislation is going in, in uh, practice, let me talk a little bit about our draft, draft data protection bill. Why we as an organization uh, are very concerned about it and many people with us is because it doesn't protect individual rights enough. And basically, there are, I guess the concerns could be grouped in three broad categories. First of all, what the bill really does is not protect people's rights, uh, not even protect data, I think, but protect actually uh, businesses from liability. It sets out a clear framework of rules for businesses to follow, which is helpful, but not necessarily strong enough. So, for example, purpose limitation is in the bill, uh, but is framed in a very broad way where any purpose that is considered fair and reasonable can, uh, it is considered a legitimate purpose. Now, part of the reason we are having these discussions is because we are not actually agreeing on what is fair and reasonable, right? So if that's not defined in the bill, that's a real problem. Um, another example is that there is no data minimization requirement in the bill either. So really, the bill still allows uh, businesses to take data of Indian citizens on a broad range of grounds without many limitations, though some regulation and, and some rules. The second concern is that the government has very broad leeway to take data of citizens without their consent for any function of the state, which again is a very broad um, uh, definition. There's also broad exemptions in the name of the security of the state, and not only the detection, investigation, and prosecution of an offense, but also the prevention of offenses, which means that the intelligence agencies or law enforcement can basically uh, collect data on any ground, right? Having prevention of offenses in this bill really also fundamentally changes the doctrine of citizenship, the relationship between citizens and the state, because what it fundamentally does is rather than see citizens as right-bearing subjects, it creates everybody uh, as a suspect. That is implicitly the framing of a bill like that. Um, and maybe to mention also that in this bill as well, there is a requirement for data localization. So if you see this broad uh, um, sweep that the government gives, or the broad right that the government gives itself to collect data, together with data localization as a requirement where at least a copy of all data has to be stored in India, that becomes a cause for concern. And then the third broad area of challenges with that particular bill is that it seems like a data protection bill for the 20th century. And what I mean by that is that if you take the GDPR, the, the uh, European legislation as the, the benchmark, there are clear protections or clear insertion of rights that see what algorithms and the new datafication of social life does to people, what are the kind of rights that we need to protect people against that. So I'm thinking, for example, the right to explanation if, there is, uh, if uh, you are affected by algorithmic decision-making in any way in your personal life. So to ask for an explanation of that right. Um, unfortunately, the current draft of the bill in India doesn't have any of the next generation rights written into it. Now, how have we gotten here, right? Because Luca was saying we've gotten the right to privacy confirmed by the Supreme Court as a fundamental right under the Indian Constitution, and this bill doesn't seem to go very far. Um, some people might have conspiracy theories, but I think, uh, to be fair to the Indian government, what really is the issue here is the thinking that informs this bill, and which is not all that different from the thinking that informs Silicon Valley companies, um, policies or behavior de developments um, and which really is focused on how we look at data. And so here I want to come to the second part of my talk and really question, I think, to, to address the challenges that we are facing, whether it is in Russia, whether it is in India. We are struggling at the moment because if you talk about data the way The Economist and the World Economic Forum did in the publications that Luca showed earlier as a resource, it is very hard to find back 
um, against a policy as the one proposed in India right now, in a country where challenges of economic inequality, for example, are still real, and data seems to provide a real possibility for, econom for the economy to grow, for the, econ for the country uh, economically to catch up, right? So the, the thinking that I'm talking about, I'm just going to read you a small par uh, paragraph of the e -commerce, draft e-commerce policy. It says, in the area, area, era of industri indu sorry, in the era of Industrial Revolution 4.0, like the BRICS uh, conference last year <coughs> title, economic development is based on data which is generated, stored, transmitted, or processed in large volumes. The increasing importance of data warrants treating it at par with other resources on which a country would have a sovereign right. Now, the challenge here and the link with what, for example, Silicon Valley companies do is treating data as a resource. And then, obviously, in a country like India, this becomes a national resource. Treating it as a resource means that it's just out there. It's up for grabs for whoever wants to, to mine it, take it, appropriate it. That kind of really disembodied understanding of data is not actually reflecting reality. It's not as if all of this data suddenly happened to be out there. A whole lot of things happened. Centrally is that, as uh, Luca has also already hinted at, Data is generated by human beings. At the center of this ecosystem are people who have bodies and whose actions are actually leading to this data coming into the ecosystem. Seeing that people and bodies are always inscribed in social relationships that entail power inequalities, that means that the data is social as well and inscribed in power relations which means that how you use that data will have very different effects for very different people. The second point is that the line between our physical bodies, who we are offline or think of as offline, and our digital bodies is increasingly disappearing. And in India we have some radical examples of this. In our unique identification system, people need to, for example, uh, give fingerprints as you do in Brazil in many places actually. Uh, to get rations. They have a right to ration under the law, but if the fingerprint identification doesn't work, you're not going to get your rations. We've had people die of starvation in the country on account of not getting those rations. Now, how do you treat that issue then? The shopkeeper knows that you are the person who you say you are standing in front of that shopkeeper. But the system doesn't recognize your data. And if you are not, not recognized by the system, the data about your body is actually giving priority over your physical body. This is really a fundamental change about how we think about bodies and human beings. And this is really important to take into account because it has far-reaching challenges for how we manage our boundaries, for how we deal with vulnerabilities in our life, for how we are able to maintain spaces of dignity and integrity. And I won't have time to really go into detail about how this plays out in practice, but I hope that one example I gave you gives a little bit of an idea of what is this about. In terms of um, the consequences though, this means that for example, that question of that example I gave you, this is not, you're not going to solve a person dying because the system recognizes things, the data is more important than the physical body standing in front of the person. You're not going to solve that problem by our traditional frameworks of data protection, right? We, data protection as such, again, we're not saying pr protection of the person. We're saying protection of the data as if, as if it is this thing out there. But this is not just a privacy any issue anymore. This is a bodily integrity issue. This is a matter of life and death in this particular case, right? And so some of the challenges and some of the, the, the debates we are having around these issues cannot be resolved within the current frameworks because we are not asking that fundamental question about what data is. And finally, I just want to briefly mention um, how do you get this on, on the agenda, right? There is some very valuable work done by um, two academics, Nick Aldry and uh, Ulysses Medias, whose name I'm not sure I'm pronouncing right, to be honest, but who point out that actually this issue where 
bodies are not on the table anymore, that structural denying of people in this ecosystem is very similar to colonialism. And so what they are arguing is that data colonialism is not just a metaphor. In their work, they show how structurally, if you look at how colonialism operated, it is very similar to what is happening with data today. So that, for example, if we now, if people and bodies disappear in the debate about data colonialism, that happens to rhetorical constructions like what we saw on the cover of The Economist, which are quite similar to how colonizers constructed, for example, this idea of no man's land. Empty lands as if people in the rest of the world who are not white were not living in these places. Constructing land as if it was cheap and for free because it's not, there's nobody there, right? They show in their work very concretely those kind of links. And I think for me that's a really important way in, in terms of getting more space to think about these alternative approaches to data. It is in countries like Brazil and like India that we have experienced the legacy of colonialism the strongest in the past. And that we know the really deep inequalities that that led to. If we know that there is now a structural move going on, surely in our countries we cannot afford to just ignore that. And so if there is an alternative approach to put on the table, I think that's really where we should start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anya. Also to start introducing uh, this more critical approach and what I was also hinting at before, uh, that. The, the solutions that now we consider as a model uh, may be perhaps very good, for instance, for other countries, other realities. Uh, the, GDP, the, the, the renowned GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation of the European Union, is probably an excellent solution for the European Union, but one has also to question whether the same approach may be very good also for other realities. And uh, maybe if in other realities, uh, in a, a different approach, different solutions, they are not simply copying and pasting uh, other frameworks, may be more, uh, more uh, efficient, more uh, sustainable. And the example that you gave before is actually quite striking. When the uh, automatic decision making based on the elaboration of, of data impact the possibility of someone to get food and can lead to someone dying because the system doesn't recognize the fingerprints or the, or the facial image. So, uh, on this uh, very optimistic note, <laughs> let's move to uh, the analysis of China and uh, with to Min's uh, presentation on uh, securing China and how the, actually the Chinese government is uh, utilizing the, this digital strategy in order to uh, secure its position as a uh, digital superpower. Well, thank you, Dr. Gawi, and thank you to the FGB Law School for hosting me here. Uh, like Anya and many of my colleagues here, my um, Portuguese is very limited. Uh, so I rely on the excellent job the translators are doing this afternoon for our communication. Uh, Yes, I want to applaud them for doing a really wonderful job, so thank you. Um, let me begin with a story. America, the world's uh, superpower, faces a rising power from Asia. It's seen as America's greatest technological and economic threat. Guilty of uh, inter intellectual property rights, currency manipulation, state-sponsored um, industrial policies, and more. Well, guess what? The rising power I'm talking about here is not China. It's Japan in the 1980s. It's remarkable how today's uh, U.S.-China rivalry, as many of you have seen on television and read about in newspapers, uh, really mirrors what happened between the United States and Japan more than 30 years ago. In that particular conflict, uh, Japan actually blinked and suffered a fateful descent uh, ever since. Of course, China today is not Japan 35 years ago. Japan, after all, was a US ally back then. And China today is an authoritarian power and America's greatest and per perhaps largest um, strategic competitor. So it's almost, for me, impossible to talk about 
uh, China's cybersecurity and digital policies here without placing them in this larger geopolitical context of China's rise against America's relatively, uh, relative decline in power, uh, especially following the United States on popular wars overseas and the recent financial crisis. So in China, over the last 40 years, more than 500 million people have been lifted out of poverty. And by 2015, China has surpassed the United States on all the indicators listed here. So at the same time, however, we must recognize that China is also the world's largest authoritarian country, ruled by a single party without competitive national elections or the rule of law. The Chinese president last year also uh, removed the term limit for himself, a move seen by many uh, governments and people and organizations around the world uh, as dangerous and very alarming. So driven by the ambition to, similar to the United States, make China great again, the Chinese government is challenging the global order of which America uh, has been its major and principal architect and guardian. And this includes America's long-standing and unchallenged position as the world's leader in technological innovation and business development. However, also in the past 20 years also, China has managed to develop its own technological ecosystem independent from the global system centered around Silicon Valley. In every category from social media to web applications, China has its own businesses and tech champions. Some have even become very successful globally, such as Huawei, which has been in the news lately, and ZTE last year, and TikTok. Many of the students here are probably know more about that um, than many of us. So what are some of China's most recent developments in digital policy making? I argue that China's digital policies are driven by two grand strategies, the Internet Plus initiative in the, internally and the Belt and Road initiative externally. On the more specific policy front, China adopts something called cyber sovereignty, very similar to some of the um, bills and legislation we have heard about from other countries. Uh, this is the overarching digital policy for China, guided by this idea in the last few years, China has passed a canopy of digital policies from cybersecurity to de technological development to personal data protection. So let me allow, uh, allow me to elaborate on each one of them. Internally, the Internet, uh, Internet Plus plan was unveiled in 2015 to use the Internet and other information technology, such as big data, cloud computing, why not, to upgrade China's uh, traditional industries from agricultural to manufacturing. Externally, the government adopted in 2015 also a global development strategy called the Belt and Road Initiative, which uh, will invest over $160 billion uh, in infrastructure development outside China, that is in Asia, Europe, Africa, the Middle East and the Americas, including Brazil. This initiative is targeted uh, to be completed in 2049. A parallel digital initiative called the Digital Silk Road Initiative involves internet infrastructure upgrades, uh, space cooperation, common technology standards development, and improvement in uh, policing systems. While the Chinese government argues that you know, these initiatives will um, open new markets improve infrastructure and create jobs, uh, critics also fear that it will, um, these will promote new forms of colonialism and digital colonialism that um, Anya just talked about. So as mentioned a moment ago, cyber sovereignty is China's overarching digital policy. Rather than appealing to the idea, for instance, that the internet um, as a globally connected infrastructure, sovereign somehow in its own right, or individual sovereignty that Anya talked about that places human dignity at the center of digital policy making, the Chinese government um, is promoting a state-centric model 
of cyber sovereignty, whereby the governments exercise control over the internet and its citizens within their borders. Administratively, the Chinese government created something called the Cyberspace Administration of China, CAC, in 2014 as the central focal point uh, for internet regulation and uh, control, answerable all the way to the president himself. In 2017, China passed the monumental uh, cybersecurity law that codified the idea of uh, cyberspace sovereignty and specifically through data localization uh, provisions, similar to other countries that we've heard about. In addition, uh, with the Made in China 2025 plan, uh, the Chinese government hopes to turn China from a world's manu uh, manufacturer factory to the world's leading innovator, emphasizing indigenous, uh, indigenous innovation and self-sufficiency. Uh, self so on the data, um, personal data protection front, China also has made some modest strides. Uh, the government passed a number of uh, protection provisions and laws, recently spurred by what happened in the EU uh, through EU's general data protection regulation, the Chinese state and academics are also um, ruminating on its responses and strategies. To conclude, allow me to summarize some of the key features of recent Chinese digital policy making and use the US ban on Huawei recently as a illustrating example. First and foremost, China's cybersecurity is grounded in the leadership's concern for domestic vulnerability and instability. As the episodes of you know, US ban on Huawei and ZTE have demonstrated to Chinese leadership, that China is still very dependent on the US for core technologies such as semiconductors and chips. This perception of this vulnerability um, will spur China to, uh, to uh, even further develop its technological capacity and uh, achieve a sense of self-sufficiency. Second, the Chinese Communist Party um, perceives self-preservation um, as a primary concern. So China's cybersecurity laws and legislations um, in general are intended to enhance the party's power instead of eroding it. So the US ban on Huawei and ZTE are almost seen by party leaders as threats to the party's survival itself. And third, although China's cybersecurity legislation acknowledges the citizens' rights to privacy and data protection, it also gives the government almost absolute rights and power to surveil and um, discipline its citizens. And fourth, corporations, whether domestic or, or foreign, are subject to China's uh, cyber sovereignty. In fact, their current leadership views technology and, and corporations as instruments of the state. So which makes China's uh, internet companies like Huawei, you know, incredibly suspicious overseas. And fifth, the Chinese leadership ambition to make China great again um, includes components of uh, technological supremacy. The idea uh, somehow paradoxically also fuels China's technological rivalry against the United States. And finally, I believe International cooperation, as the Chinese government recognizes, is also important and possible. So to, to achieve it, however, international agreements and norms and standards must be created and maintained to allow important issues such as cyber espionage, cyber crime, cyber defense, um, and so on, uh, to create a platform for dialogue where China can play an important role. So to conclude, by and large, I don't think you know, um, users organizations or countries want to be forced to choose which side of the new uh, Berlin Wall you know you want to live on and it's just uh, not something people want to be forced to choose and to do so let's hope that perhaps US and China can somehow dial down their ambitions and rivalries and together with the international community create a more peaceful path forward thank you Thank you very much for your excellent overview of the most recent uh, developments. Uh, and actually, when we speak about uh, espionage, cyber threats, it's inevitable also to uh, think about cyber crime. And this is a very good uh, lead to the 
last presentation of this uh, session and then before uh, we open for debate I would like to invite uh, Sagwadi to deliver her presentation on the current context of cybercrime in uh, uh, sorry, cybersecurity in South Africa. Thank you Luca. Um, good afternoon everyone and thank you for giving me this platform to be able to speak to you today. Uh, my name is Sakwaji Mawanda. I am a uh, researcher at the University of the West in Cape South Africa. And my research focus is on cybercrime, but today I decided to challenge myself and be a bit adventurous and uh, try to give you a landscape <coughs> overview of the cybersecurity, um, how cybersecurity looks like in South Africa. So I'll be looking at some of the um, legal provisions and policies of um, cybersecurity aspects. Um, in South Africa. So, when considering cybersecurity in South Africa, one of the first things that you need to look at would be the National Cybersecurity Policy Framework. That framework was introduced in 2012 uh, by the Ministry of uh, State Security. And basically what it tries to do is try to harmonize or try to discuss cybersecurity in the South African uh, context. Um, it has noted that the challenges to cyber to the challenges for the government is promoting cybersecurity across um, the government itself, from the national level, the regional level and the municipal level to the general public, to the private sector, both domestic and foreign and uh, special interest groups. This uh, National Cybersecurity Policy Framework was quite slow. Uh, it took quite a while for it to get implemented. But that is due to the fact that there is a lot of troubles concerning coordination between different governmental um, um, departments. But overall, uh, it is one of the first um, pieces of policies that everything else related to cybersecurity draws from. So the first one that I would like to uh, highlight would be um, cybercrime. Cyber, uh, South Africa is one of the most attacked countries in Africa um, when it comes to cybercrime. And to the, at present we don't have a cybercrime legislation. We're busy um, drafting a cybercrimes bill which is, um, has seen a lot of revisions. It was first introduced in 2015. Um, and has seen, I think, about two or three revisions until the um, current state it's in right now. It's being debated in the National Council of Provinces, and from then on it will be signed by the um, president into law. When it was first introduced in 2015, it was heavily criticized. One of the things that peop um, people mentioned was that it was trying to do a bit too much in a single legislation. Um, but now, after all the revisions that we've had, the, the crimes that are provided for are more streamlined, they are fewer, and they're much clearer and more relevant. The second part um, is the concept of cyber defense. When we refer to cyber defense in South Africa, we usually talk about it in terms of cyber security as a general term. I mentioned before that the South African Cyber Crimes Bill was heavily criticized for trying to do too much. And that is because when it was introduced, it was known as the Cyber Crimes and Cyber Security Bill, which meant it tried to deal with everything relating to cyber crimes from the criminal law side of things and cyber security from the national defense side of things. Many people commented that it was very vague, it was very broad, and it would, at the end of the day, not be um, very effective. They therefore decided to split the bill and streamline the um, promulgation of the Cyber Crimes Bill and decided to have the Cyber Security Bill enacted separately. They haven't done that yet, but they are busy working on it. So that will be what we'll um, refer to when we talk about cyber, cyber defense in terms of cyber security or national defense in cyberspace. Some of the things that, that uh, part of the bill mentioned was issues related to cyber warfare and cyber terrorism. So that part was also quite heavily criticized. We had to see how um, it will come into play once it gets um, enacted or it gets debated. 
The third part is with regards to privacy and data protection. Um, I think we've already mentioned that in South Africa we have a bill or a law called the Protection of Personal Information, Information Act called PUPI. That act has, is enacted, but it is not in force right now because we are waiting for um, the establishment of the information regulator, which means we have a law, but you can't really do anything with it or about it because there's no one to enforce it, which is quite a shame because a lot of people have mentioned that it's quite a good law. Um, it is modeled very closely after the GDPR, and what it tries to do is, is tries to enable citizens as data subjects to be able to bring civil um, suits against uh, firms or the government or private um, companies when there are data breaches. So it's a, it's a piece of legislation that we just really need to come into force, but again, with problems regarding uh, government coordination, it has been quite slow and quite lagged. Um, though Puppy is quite progressive, there have been comments about how it appears to give a bit too much leeway um, to the government and the national um, state security when it comes to obtaining uh, personal data, which is something that people anticipate will have constitutional um, challenges to it once it comes into force. And then the last part that I want to speak about is an issue regarding um, surveillance. Um, the main surveillance um, topic that we refer to it comes with, is when we speak about interception of uh, phone calls. Um, we refer to the regulation, okay, it's a very long one, regulation of interception of communication and provision of communication related information act. You don't need to remember that. It's called the RECA Act. That is the one that um, requires um, everyone or it requires citizens to oh it requires citizens to register their mobile uh, numbers, their SIM cards, with the mobile uh, pro providers, so that they can obtain customer details about them and they can pass them on to an office called the Office for Interception Centers. So RICA in, um, enacts two offices. The first one is the Office of Interna Interception Centers, and the second one is the National Communication Center. The first one uh, is for domestic interception of communication. The second one is for foreign um, interception of communication. And all, um, these offices provide call data records and interception for inter intelligence services the National Prosecuting Authority, and the Financial Intelligence Center. All in all, um, cyber governance and cyber security governance in South Africa is moving quite slowly. Um, it's quite frustrating how slowly it's moving. And that is mostly due to the lack of uh, organizational coordination in the government. Our previous administration had a tendency to change ministers and departments quite frequently, so there was um, there was a lot of losing of uh, communication. But um, one of the things that is posi positive about South Africa is that there's a lot of engagement from civil society, from expert groups, and government does seem to be very receptive to um, opinions and comments from the rest of the country. We are lacking when it comes to education, especially uh, of the, the general population. A lot of people don't understand what we mean when we speak about um, privacy, what we mean when we talk about uh, cyber crime, think about you know, credit card fraud as the cyber crime, but there's a lot of this, so the government can definitely do better in that. But I'm overall very optimistic, um, especially with the new administration going forward, that they, um, they will take this forward. The president is also quite optimistic about uh, the fourth industrial revolution, so yeah. So thank you very much for your attention. As we have started with 10 minutes of delay, we still have 10 minutes for a uh, debate. So if you have any questions, uh, comments, uh, remarks on what has been said, uh, please just raise your hand and uh, we can take some before the coffee break and then last uh, session. Uh, any questions? Don't be shy. Well, if you
you don't have a question, I have a question. So, uh, I'm actually uh, something that has been uh, quite uh, interesting to note is that there is a sort of division uh, in uh, approaches, uh, well, to politics, but also to digital policy in BRICS countries. Uh, and we have, on the one hand, a block of more, uh, well, let's say, uh, Sino Russian country which have more stability in, in the government. Has, has been a certain has had a certain stability over the past uh, decades, uh, and on the other hand, we have uh, other countries where, which have recently uh, uh, reshuffled and, uh, in some cases, really uh, dramatically changed the the, the, orient the political orientation of the government. So, uh, my question was more uh, for uh, Saguadi and uh, Anya. Uh, what, uh, because in Brazil we already see in which direction that the protection is going to evolve, uh, and you can already see, we can, although it's not very easy, we can assume how the institution and in, in, in legal evolution will, will evolve. In, in India and uh, South Africa, we may see a path, but we are not sure that uh, that is de facto uh, the path that will be followed. So, uh, my question: uh, If you, uh, well, if you want to have an exercise of using your crystal ball uh, to uh, try to uh, uh, understand whether the policy that has been announced and developed so far uh, will be de facto implemented uh, in the upcoming uh, year or two, or if you uh, foresee any major change. Uh, with regard to the uh, data protection, in, in, if so, for which reason in, in India, and uh, with regard to the implementation of POPI or the uh, uh, enforcement of the cybercrime uh, legislation. So, do, which one wants to go first? Please go ahead. So, I left my crystal ball at home today, so I don't really have a great answer. But if I can guess, um, there is talks about implementing both Poppy and um, the Cyber Crimes Bill, hopefully by the end of the year. It's something that is, I think is high on the agenda of the government, realizing the urgency um, of it all. I mean, the Cyber Crimes Bill has gone, like I said, through a lot of revisions, and it's at that stage where it looks really good. And um, having passed the National Assembly and gone into the Council of Provinces, it's very likely that they will pass it. I'm very optimistic by the end of the year. And the same goes to Poppy as well. The information regulator is there, they just haven't you know, employed the people that need to do the regulation. Sorry, before you re uh, reply, se vocês quiserem fazer perguntas, colocações em português, podem fazer, tem tradução simultânea. Since the government is making this a priority, and since, at least in the lower house, they have an absolute majority, it's quite likely that uh, this will become law. I'm quite concerned about that because I think a bad law right now is really. Um, we will be stuck with it for a long time. I'm not sure that having a bad law will be uh, better than having no law at all, but there's disagreement on that. Um, it's challenging though because uh, it's also true that there is massive disagreement on these issues in India, right? And I think the, the interests of business, for example, of the startup community are quite different from, say, the interests of poor citizens. Um, the law enforcement agencies are actually unhappy with the current version of the bill because they feel that there are still too many restrictions on them, so they, it seems, uh, want to have an even more lenient bill. But I think that kind of disagreement is really... Um, I think this is what is happening in many parts of the world. Um, and why I'm concerned that if it becomes a law is that it also really... It, it's part of the efforts to normalize the data ecosystem that we know today. And that, as I said earlier, I, I mean, I didn't make that point at the end of my presentation, but this question about how uh, we talk about data is not just an Indian problem, right? This is something that's done worldwide. U.S. policy support that, U.S. companies support that. It's true in the West as well as in, in the global South. And 
to challenge that fundamentally as a narrative in any case is going to take a long time. But the more legislations we have across the world that are actually uh, legitimizing this kind of ecosystem, the more difficult it is going to be to dislodge that kind of a thinking. And that's actually, so if you look back at colonialism, and I think it's really important to emphasize that those parallels are structural. They are not just metaphors. There are similarities in how these mechanisms work, right? But with colonialism, it took us, what, a few centuries to really understand the harms that this had been done. Had done. Um, we still have a chance now to question that, and what I'm concerned about is that the more, the faster bad legislation moves, the more that space will close and that we will be stuck with this for a really long time. See, there are two questions, uh, one here and one there. Si quieres hacer la pregunta en portugués, puede para mí. a question would you mind if you take also the other ones so that then we can uh, have around the answers if there are other questions we can take them we can answer them and then go to coffee break posso ler por isso pode é, é verdade eu gostaria de fazer três perguntas duas para o professor Andrei e uma para a professora Maidinho é, em relação ao professor Andrei a minha dúvida é a seguinte a ideia da Rússia de desplugar da internet global, ela seria tipo, como um firewall chinês ou ela seria um, um desplug através de hardware? É, e uma segunda questão é se o Edward Snowden na Rússia ele participa desses debates sobre internet ou ele não chega a se envolver diretamente na academia lá na Rússia? E para a professora Maidin é, em relação a Highway, é, eu li uma reportagem recente do Hospital do País sobre a utilização do governo americano das sanções para garantir a primazia da tecnologia 5G às indústrias norte-americanas. É, como você vê essa questão das sanções norte-americanas a Highway e a outras indústrias chinesas? Uh, I think we can start with uh, Min. With... Oh, yeah, so you have done So, how, how do you see the uh, the sanction with regard to the to Huawei and uh, the impact it will have on uh, Chinese technologies? Uh, this was the last question, and well, I guess Andrea has heard the other ones, and whomever wants to reply to the first one, be my guest. 
Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I think, uh, first of all, um, perhaps I would recommend to you to read my blog post uh, for CyberBricks uh, Information Program um, on this very issue. Um, it's a very complicated issue, for sure, but I think it also symbolizes, uh, in many ways, the challenges China is facing right now in terms of uh, technological development. Although in some ways it, it is a superpower, uh, but it also times, you know, at the same time that's my argument too that it's also fragile, right? Um, that it, it is still dependent on, uh, you know, a larger global ecosystem uh, to survive for uh, technological components for markets as well. And so there is, I think, quite a bit of a debate. I think we could think about in terms of uh, three. Um, related issues. One is technological uh, dependence. And second is uh, technological independence. And the last one I would think about is uh, technological interdependence, right? So three very different visions of how a nation or an organization think about its technological digital strategies. Um, China would like to think it can become more and more independent. But at the same time, I think China's own development, uh, economically and technologically, is still intertwined with the larger global world. So on, on the one hand, I think it, you know the, the government stresses self-sufficiency. Um, but on the other hand, I think it recognizes it's still very, very fragile at the same time. And that kind of interdependence, I think, is quite useful for international cooperation. Um, for thinking about how can we, um, despite all these conflicts, find a path forward because that independence is interdependence is important. Um, yeah, without saying too much about you know how this conflict will be resolved, I, I think um, I would recommend you to read that blog post. Maybe we should have a conversation over this at some point. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. First of all, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for your question. Uh, and first of all, about the differences between the uh, approach of Russia and China in scope of the uh, disconnection from the internet. Uh, uh, I think, yes, uh, the uh, technologically it could be not similar, but uh, uh, something like this. Uh, First of all, we need to read some and analyze some some legal normative acts of the executive authorities to make sure about these technical aspects. But uh, there is another issue because uh, internet in China always been under control of the government, while in Russia internet was free from the from any kind of control. There is a difference. There is a major difference. So Russian citizens uh, used to enjoy more or less free internet, unless, unless in, in China it is always under control. Uh, uh, the issue about Edward Snowden and uh, his relation academia is uh, he has the status of protected person, and that I, as I as I know he doesn't have free access. Uh, to the audience. And also, uh, last but not least, I'd like to uh, agree completely with me concerning the interdependence. That I think the, in the interdependence of the countries. And uh, I, I suppose that uh, this, the internet reflects this idea of this interdependence. And uh, this we should support this interdependence of countries, which leads to peace and internal understanding. Thank you very much. And if anyone has a very fast uh, reply for a very complicated question before we go to the coffee break. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. I've actually asked engineers that very same question because there's been entire articles written on the limitations of the right to explanation in the GDPR, right? 
and the, the, the argument in those articles was that actually it would be more useful to shift towards accountability rather than a right to explanation. Some of the engineers I talked to actually uh, questioned whether it's true that at the moment um, algorithms cannot be explained, whether we have already reached there in terms of how they are applied in everyday life. But let's even assume that we will reach there at some point in time. I think the, the question, first, there are two things. One is the right to explanation always has to be seen as part of an ecosystem of rights, right? Because you also have, for example, the right to object to profiling uh, in public interest or in legitimate interest in the GDPR. There's a whole set of rights like that. I think that's important to remember that it's never in isolation and so ideally these should obviously play out together. But also coming back to this point about putting bodies and people back into the center of the debate, um, I think it's really important for us to remember that it's not because we can do something that we have to do it. And so when we are talking about algorithms that have uh, consequences for people's lives and for questions of discrimination and privilege, if we cannot explain them, should we be using them? Because if we make these kind of questions a black box, I think as societies we are really giving moral responsibilities out of hand, right? And so then the question is not one of uh, whether it's possible or not. It's whether those algorithms should exist at all, um, and in which circumstances they might add value, and in which circumstances they aren't acceptable. I think those really are the questions we should ask. This is excellent food for thought for our coffee break. Uh, a gente vai voltar em uh, 10, 15 minutinhos com uma excelente última sessão com o nosso uh, professor visitante Ian Brown uh, e vários membros das várias agências e departamento do governo, o Jefferson foi na da Casa Civil, a, a Marion Bima do uh, MCT, a Patrícia Sarkovski do CAD e o Nino Pasquale do Anatanatel. Então, 10, máximo 15 minutinhos para nos energizar e depois voltar ao último debate intenso com os nossos especialistas. Obrigado.